I'm fine. Usually I don't speak well behind a podium, usually because I'm so short people can't see me behind it. But we'll go ahead and get started here. I kind of want to follow up on a lot of the things that Dr. Deaton and David Ritter have talked about. We have a lot of concerns, everybody, and quite frankly in these situations we have more questions than we have answers. The part that scares us is just that, what we don't know. And the minute somebody says the word cancer, that's the real threat. Because it could be us, it could be our kids. And the threat here primarily comes from the one carcinogen that we know of for sure, and that's benzene. I've had experience with this, but mostly it's always been with people that work in an occupational setting. Somebody in Ohio that builds tires. He's in there and he's putting the rubber together and guess what makes the rubber fuse together and stick to make tires? Benzene. They get it from naphtha, which is a waste product that they get when they're refining the oil and they apply it to the rubber and it makes your tires. Same for a steel worker. When he's in there and they're working and they're making the steel and they're burning the coal, what's released in the air? Benzene. And the threat for these workers are is that they're in a setting where they're trapped, essentially. They're there and they're breathing it every day. Industry will try to tell and reassure their workers, you're okay, this is a low dose. We're measuring it. It's just not that much in the air. We put the little monitors around and you're not getting that much. But the problem is, you're getting that low dose exposure over an extended period of time. And these individuals, they're working day after day after day. What happens? Benzene causes leukemia. It affects the blood forming organs in your body. Now, when you actually have a benzene case and you're trying this case, you end up having to rely upon your experts. And medical science has reached the point that certain, certain leukemias they know are caused by benzene. Others, the debate still wages, but we know one thing, it's dangerous. And when we're drilling in our communities, and back in January, if you remember, the Star-Telegram had several articles. There was benzene in the air. Now when that gas well is on the other side of your fence and you smell the smell of petrochemicals and you can just smell once you can smell that smell of the hydrocarbons that's dangerous I know that I don't want my family right by a gas well I don't want to smell that you know when you go and you pump your gas in the car you know in your car you go well typically that should be, as an everyday person, your highest exposure to benzene. That smell, that sweet smell, that's the benzene. Because it's an aromatic hydrocarbon. And benzene does have what many consider to be a more pleasant odor. But it's dangerous. Now, benzene just doesn't exist there. It exists in a lot of products. And I'm going to relate back to this in a minute about the importance and how industry tries to portray this as being safe. Benzene exists, for example, the worst occupation, one of the worst occupations you can have, don't be a floor stripper. A lot of the paint thinners, paints, they have a high concentration of benzene. My uncle died of, of leukemia. He lived in Angleton, Texas. and Uncle Bob died of leukemia and we never really knew why. But it wasn't until I became a lawyer and started getting involved in benzene, I realized Uncle Bob was a painter. I know how he got, I know how he got leukemia now. It's from benzene. When he used paint thinners, when he used paints, it's not just paints. Glues. For example, don't let your kids build model planes. The little tester's glue has, has benzene in it. You can go and you can find, you can go to an art store. The paint thinners, again. So benzene exists in a variety of products. It also exists in some hair care products. I don't know if you knew, but beauticians, they run a risk as well. 
of being exposed to benzene. So here's where I'm taking this in a big circle. Industry now wants to try to tell you, oh, we're going to tell you what's in that fracking fluid. Go to that Chesapeake website. And one of the things they list is petroleum distillates. Now let's talk about petroleum distillates. What is that? Well, when they distill petroleum and they take it to the refinery, they burn it at different temperatures and you can get your different hydrocarbons of different varieties out of that. That's what they call generally petroleum distillates. But they don't always exist in an exactly pure form. You just don't have xylene or hexane or benzene. They're not pure. And benzene will exist as a contaminant in those hydrocarbons. So benzene will exist in petroleum distillates. Well, they try to reassure you by in the next column telling you commonly used in consumer goods. Hair care products, for example. You have nothing to worry about. They don't tell you that the consumer goods are dangerous themselves. So my point is this. There is a potential harm and risk for all of us when we exist in a setting where they are drilling, drilling for gas in an urban setting. Now, right now, there is a problem, one that exists right now, and you've heard about it here. Our land values are going down. If you have that well on the other side of your fence, who wants to buy your house now? Who wants to buy that place you bought out in the country because you thought it was going to be a nice place for your retirement? You're going to get to have your horses. You're going to get to stay out there and have the fresh air and live like... Live life in the way that you planned it for years. You work toward that day when you could have that. Have that dream, and it's not there now. Because when you go out into that pasture, you look down, and sometimes there might be some sort of film on that water when it just rained, and you don't know what that is, but it smells bad. Now, the threat is now we know that the property values are going down. But with this benzene in the air, what will happen in 5, 10, 15 years? There's a term called latency. It's generally the time period between the time of your first exposure to a carcinogen and the onset of actual cancer. It varies for everyone. And sometimes it can be decades. For children, it can be a shorter period of time. But for most adults, we're talking 5, 10, to 15 year period. But if you're exposed to that continual dose over a period of time, that's that continual low dose exposure. In many of my cases that I would have with benzene, especially ones that would be involving consumer products, the manufacturers would come up to me and say, why are you suing me? Yes, there's benzene, but it's a trace amount. When anybody says that to you, just shake your head. There are a lot of, a lot of very well-respected doctors out there that will tell you that there really isn't a safe amount. There really is no safe exposure to benzene. But many of the reports over the years have tried to portray it that if you get below a certain amount of exposure to benzene, that that's not harmful. And that's really what happened in the years up until now of of government trying to, to regulate the exposure to benzene. And it began, we've known at least since 1900, the turn of the century, that benzene was harmful. And 1978 was when OSHA made that first real step to try to limit exposure to benzene in the workplace. There's a part, there's a term of one part per million over an eight hour period is the threshold that they wanted to reduce it to. But government wanted to keep it at 10, and they kept, I mean, not government, um, industry wanted to keep it at 10 because they felt that, you know, reducing it to one part per million over that time period was just going to be too harmful for them. It would hurt business too much. And then at that time, science couldn't really prove that there'd be a, a benefit to the workers and to the public. OSHA insisted, it ended up being a Supreme Court case in 1980. 
and they threw out the standard. Eventually that standard was, was reinforced. But my point is it takes a long time to get industry to recognize a threat because ultimately it means dollars for them if they have to make these changes to protect people. But ultimately now this is in our backyard. It's not a choice that we have at all. Many, many people that are landowners, they don't have the mineral rights. And, and I, I, I can't tell you how, how badly I feel for that individual that bought that piece of land, does not own the mineral rights, and he comes home and sees his fence torn down, and that rig is by his house. He doesn't have a say-so. And the law right now says that because he's not the landowner, he has a, because he's not the mineral owner, that mineral owner has a superior, superior right, superior interest to go in there and place that well. And those are the rules that we have, but the fact is we do face a threat. We have a threat of illness. And so as I'm standing here today, I don't like to be the bad guy that just tries to put a big sad face on everybody, but I want to tell you the truth is that there are dangers out there, and especially if it's close to your home. Especially if you're in a situation where you can smell those smells. Because the truth is, we don't really have, um, just as, as people, our, our sense of smell really is comparatively not that sensitive. And I say this because you can be receiving well over 10 parts per million of benzene and you won't be able to smell it. It takes much more than that before you can even smell it. So my point is, you can be getting a dangerous, low-dose exposure to benzene continually and not have the benefit of your nose being able to tell you that you're breathing it. So, I didn't want to take up too much time here. I want to tell you about those things in terms of the risk of benzene, the exposure that you have. But we live, and as many of you can see, and I see the frustration that many people have, is that what can we do? How do we deal with this problem? And the truth is, many times when you try to go through fighting it with the government, the regulatory agencies that we have, that many times were created to protect the public, quite frankly, it doesn't work like we think that it should. And a lot of times, that's where I've come in before in the past. As you know that, yes, ultimately, but we don't want it to come to that point to where somebody is sick and saying, yes, and I have leukemia now because there was that well in my backyard. I applaud all of you for being here because I know you're concerned. And yes, it's important for us to let our friends and neighbors know that there is a, is a threat out there. Because collectively, the best solution is the more people that voice an opinion, and the more people that know of the danger, and the better organized our communities are, that's the best way to fight this. So thank you for being here. Please let your friends and neighbors know that there is a concern out there. That if you can smell these chemicals in the air, that's not good for us. Thank you.